The first film, as I say, as you say, we did with, with Alvin, that was uh, Tim Burstall, yep. who was a guy who was had sort of, um, people had mixed feelings about because the, a lot of the filmmakers thought, oh, it's all a bit too commercial, which I never quite understood. But he was a lovely, lovely guy to work for. Van, I loved it. Working Nothing with him. wrong with being a commercial director. Well, I thought that too, but anyway. Um, but um, he was such a lovely guy. He was, he was one of the most appreciative men ever. Uh, referred to all his, his staff as heroes. Walk in, good morning, heroes, what's on? Oh, it's the war scene, this'll be good. <laughs> Everything was good morning, heroes. He was a really, really enthusiastic guy. And he was very, very dedicated to he mortgaged his house, the first house he had. He made a film that I saw, and I saw it because um, I saw it at Supreme Sound in 1959, 1960, maybe called The Prize. So this is way back when he was starting out. Oh yes, yeah. that's right. And he, he put his kids in, the, in these big barrels on the, in the Yarra, or, 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 I think a faster flying river than that. And, and I think he risked his kids' lives and, 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 and his house <laughs> to make movies. So he was a very dedicated guy. But that was the first feature we ever mixed was um, Alvin and Burstall. And you've mentioned Tim Burstall, and we're going to get to it. You, you've worked with Peter Weir, Bruce Beresford, Fred Skepsey, mm. all of the, um, Phil Noyce, yeah. all the directors that came out of this period that were the resurgence in the Australian film industry. They were. So, it, mate, it was a very exciting industry, because, very exciting time. Um, that'll, that, that'll never happen again, or for, for it to happen again, the film industry will need to collapse again for 30 or 40 years and start again. Mm. And we don't want that to happen. Well, but, we did have a film industry you, way, way back, you know, absolutely. in the silent era. Mm. We led the world. Sure. And then nothing happened and, for 40 and, well, years. Well, they did a lot of films like On Our Selection and that sort of stuff. Yeah. 40,000 Horsemen, those sort of things. They were made in the 30s and, the, and perhaps the early 40s, or certainly the 30s. But after the war, um, the Americans, I think, had somehow assumed control of all the distribution outlets. Outlets. So as a kid, I grew up, as I say, I was born in 36. All the films I watched as a kid were American propaganda films about the war with, you know, um, John, John Wayne, Wayne yes. you know, <laughs> winning the war or, or Audie Murphy or, or uh, Randolph Scott or whoever. And so um, there, was no, there was so little done in Australia from the end of World War II, which is 1945, to the early 70s. Yeah, things like Jeddah and a few odd ones popped through, but there wasn't really an industry. That's right. Yeah. And, and you had some co-productions like The Sundowners and um, yeah. uh, Age of Consent and They're a Weird Mob and so on. But essentially, it was always Ameri English director, English producer. We didn't have anyone who could direct. Uh, <coughs> no. There were Weird Mobs, actually very good film, but it's an English director, sure. Michael Powell. Sure. Um, coming, so another really important Australian film, 1974, Stone. Oh, this was, Stone. This oh. was a breakthrough film in many ways. Sure. Australian director Sandy Harbert, his, yep. his first and only film, um, produced by David Hannay. Yep. One of, the, one of the first things he did. Yeah. What was it like working on that, that group of people doing a bikey film effectively? Well it, well, it was exciting, but they were all exciting. I mean, it was exciting to be working in the film industry because we were just starting again. So you were sort of learning what to do as you were making serious movies, very important movies. You went to the premiere and all the important people in the town were there and so on in their, in their good suits and so on and the mayor was there and, and, and it was all very exciting. And Stone, Stone was a very interesting film because it was the first rock and roll film really. Mm. And, it, and it had a lot of rock and roll music in it obviously. Um, and it, it, was a, it was a film that became a cult film because I mean they were still showing Stone on Television, it's a precursor eight. to the Mad Maxes and all of that. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So it it was a very uh, it was interesting to make. The only difficulty I had mixing it was whenever I pulled up uh, Sandy and the musical director. I wish I knew his name, and I've, I don't remember anymore. We were sitting down right down the front near the speaker because louder there. They'd say, "What did you stop for?" They were listening to the music. <laughs> we said, "We're mixing a picture up here." <laughs> um, I'm trying to work. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to work. <laughs> Every now and again, we're going to have to stop. But that, what, what, what year was that? Did you say 74? So, so that's 74, yeah. Yeah. Well, that must have just preceded... Um, oh, um, I think before that, we might have done The Cars at 8 Paris for Peter Weir. Um, Is that right? That come, well, that's in the same year, oh, according okay. to IMDb okay. here. Okay. So it may have come before or after that. But in and the that same was year. exotic because that was the first widescreen one we did. 
And so we actually had two 35mm projectors just set up as in Glen Glen with carbon arcs that you burnt, you know, for, for image. Um, and we could, we could cross from one to the other. So when we, when we mixed our film, we mixed to a black and white 35 millimeter work print. When we finished the reel, we put the color work print on and play it. And believe me, it sounds different. I don't care what anybody says. When you're looking at color and you've been looking at black and white for eight hours or six hours mm -hmm. for a reel and you play it, it all sounds brighter. Anyway, we put that on. When we finished the say 11 or 12 reels, those, those reels were, were cued for crossovers, uh, changeovers, they call them. They'd be a, it'd, it'd scratch a couple of, uh, or with a, with a uh, yellow pencil, you'd put three or four crosses on three or four frames, yeah. 12 feet or something, 13 feet before the end of the reel, and one a foot, or what it was to go, and the projections would go clang, clang, and you'd go from that one to that one. Yep. And the tracks would take off with them. You'd lock up dubber one with dubber projector one and so on. We had changeover, we saw the film, hour and a half long, 12 changeovers, beautiful. Real film mixing. Right. Sadly, and I say sadly, that, that um, became video images which you couldn't even see properly and so on because that was money, but that was some years later. But for the first several years, that's how we mixed the movies. It was fantastic. To a work print, but a really good quality. You oh, could absolutely, see it on the big screen. absolutely. It came out of colour film. I know many good cinematographers will say, you know, a good sound mix makes my pictures look better. Well, it probably does. It's probably true. It probably because it's true. a perception thing, but you know, it, it does. It makes the film Absolutely. look better if it's got a good sound track to it. But they were so exciting because I still remember the opening scenes of that film of, of um, and it's Peter Weir's first film. It's not. It, it's um, story-wise, it's a little bit disjointed in places, but visually, it looks great and sounds great yeah. still to this day. But it's also it's a it's a good. Uh, it's a good script, isn't it? Like people living off car accidents they designed and, and the mad doctor doing brain surgery, you know, with a, <laughs> with a, with a black and decker drill. And, and uh, Peter Weir's pictures, I, I just think he's a genius, Peter Weir. I, this might sound funny. I'm not a film fanatic. I'm, I'm, I was a sound fanatic for quite a long time. Not a film fanatic. I mean, there's no way you'd get, you'd get me to go and watch Rambo. I couldn't care less. I like pictures that have really good relationships between the people. And his pictures always had that. And they always had a really sort of eerie twist. I mean, I mixed uh, Picnic at Hanging Rock. I mean, what happened in Picnic? Absolutely nothing. It was a great movie. Nothing happened. Well, and it was Picnic a great is like two different movies stuck together. <laughs> First half and second half are very different stories, really. And they're both very good, I think, but they kind of don't feel like they belong together. Oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> My wife saw Picnic three times. The women, when I say the women, I mean, that might sound you know, derogatory, but females loved Picnic. I know girls that saw it three and four times. After the, this, is, this is the story about Picnic. My wife saw it three times. And there's a scene in the film where they rescue a couple of the, of the, of the kids and there's a hand reaches up and um, I, think it's, I think it's Johnny Jarrett, the actor. Yeah. His hand reaches up and the kid's hand comes down and they touch and they meet. So, and my wife saw it, she said, there was a ring on this hand, you know? And I rang up Peter Weir, I said, listen, mate, my wife discovered something that I never saw. He said, what is it? And I told him, he said, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> she thought it was a plot thing, you know? <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> you know, he's, he's really married or she's really or whatever. Anyway, she saw yeah, it. John Joe just probably forgot yeah. to take off his own ring. <laughs> who knows, who knows, who knows? But it was a beautiful looking picture, but in all honesty, what happened? A lot of kids. Well, we never around. know what happened to the girls. That's right. Well, nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> they went away. We never found them. Yes. But it was good.